Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is Thursday, February 26, 2015. It's the Allington School Committee's public hearing on the FY16 school budget. Uh, I'm looking out at the audience. I am now going to ask the audience, is there anyone here in the audience that would like to uh, talk on uh, the school committee's uh, proposed budget at this time? Seeing no one at this time, I am going to adjourn the public hearing. Public hearing meeting is now adjourned. I am now going to open the regular school committee meeting uh, and would invite, uh, I would just like to make a couple of announcements. Uh, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, uh, Mr. Pierce is not here tonight for, and uh, Dr. Ampey is not here tonight. Both for personal reasons will not be here. The rest of the committee is present. Former Arlington Public School Secretary Patricia M. Boone passed away today, Thursday, February 19th excuse me, on last Thursday, February 19th. Pat Boone was a secretary at the Bishop Elementary School and is the aunt of Connie Russell at the payroll department. At this time, we will now have public participation. Uh, I would invite uh, Marie McPhere. McPhere. Thank you, I apologize. Hi, I'm Marie Mateer, and I'm here on behalf of the Arlington Education Foundation. Um, and in particular, our technology initiative. And I'm here to invite you all to a really exciting event we're having uh, in honor of the math, sciences, <coughs> computer sciences, and that is Pi Day. So 3.14, March 14th, Saturday, March 14th, 0.15, so with 2015, this is Super Pi Day. Uh, we are going to have a gathering at the um, Common Ground from uh, 3 to 5. No, 9.26. Yeah, my husband six. told me. It's my, not three, it's nine. <laughs> my husband told me that uh, if we'd have it at nine in the morning, we would get several more digits in pi, and I said, forget it. So, <laughs> because we are, uh, we, we'll have a cash bar, beer at nine in the morning, and, and pies donated from uh, local bakeries and stores. Uh, this is to raise funds for the technology initiative. We're uh, raising funds for um, additional uh, computer labs at the middle school for both uh, the sixth grade and for all grades for the engineering program. Um, and so that the, at the high school, the sciences uh, ha will have uh, the technology they need to do modeling. They had hoped to share with computer sciences, but the success of computer science means the sciences haven't had uh, the equipment they need. Uh, we are looking to raise uh, well over $100,000 on this campaign. Uh, we are charging forward. Uh, we're hoping getting everybody together for Pi Day. Um, where you'll see some science and math and computer science in action and learn lots of ways to calculate pi from the math club. Um, and so it will raise awareness. So please, uh, we hope you can make it and we hope you'll pass this on to all the people you know who want to raise a toast to uh, science, math, uh, and engineering at uh, Arlington Schools. Any questions? Did I leave anything out? Pi Day, how could you forget the date? Yeah. That's Pi great. Day. Three to five, mm -hmm. common ground. Three to five, common ground. Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Lever? And I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Okay. Both. Oh, I'm sorry. And Amy McMahon? Yeah, we'll, we'll come up together. Um, I'll start actually with a, a note of deeply felt thanks to Superintendent Bodie and, and, and Bill and, and Paul to you. Uh, for all attending the uh, dedication of the McSweeney Center at EDCO uh, a couple months back. That was very meaningful, and, and uh, Eileen was very thankful for, for everyone who was there. And, of course, um, you represented Arlington very well, so thank you for that. Uh, we're here to speak uh, together about um, an issue that is um, maybe one that's not fully within the committee's control, but, but is something that we wanted to raise here, and, and that is the challenges with the bus route, uh, bus, bus one and bus two in, in, the, uh, in the Bishop District, and the challenges uh, recently that have been experienced around getting around uh, and, and traveling through the streets. And um, I know Amy has written a note and has spoken to the, uh, the head of DPW uh, about the challenges, but there have been some incidents just this week, and I'm sure you're all aware of them, 
but uh, the parents in the neighborhood have some pretty significant concerns about safety, and we wanted to make sure that we raised them here. Just in the event that someone's not aware, um, there have been at least three incidents with the bus, um, two where it's been in contact with another car, one stunk at a snowbank. Um, no one's been hurt, and obviously we're all grateful for that. Um, you know, we all deal with the challenges of the narrow streets. We're all familiar with that. We have a keen awareness of budgetary limitations. Um, I think we just want to feel like that there is some sense of that this is something that's important that matters and is going to be addressed, that, that someone is taught, and, and the bus driver, we all hasten to say, Steve has done a fabulous job dealing with a nearly impossible situation. Um, but it's our sense that perhaps with some coordination with DPW and the message, the reason we're here is the message I got from the director of DPW was, was that he needed kind of a direct request um, from the school committee, from the superintendent to be able to prioritize in any way making the bus route safer. Um, and, you know, there's several options. Obviously, you know, plowing the entire <coughs> snow removal along the entire bus route is probably not feasible at this juncture. Um, but if anyone's consulted with the bus driver, he may, my guess is, have a very good sense of what few key areas are particularly problematic for him. Um, also, all the incidents that have occurred, to my knowledge, have all been on the morning runs, none of them in the afternoon runs. So I imagine it's a combination of school plus regular rush hour traffic. Um, you know, e even something as a temporary solution of having a police cruiser run in front of the bus for the 45 minute run that it takes to do the two runs might be a low cost, low marginal cost, highly effective solution until the streets are able to be widened and the intersections can be dealt with in a way where he can operate the bus in a safe manner on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll, I'll add that I exchanged notes with, uh, with Adam, town, town manager, and, and he's been in direct touch with the, the head of DPW. He was very responsive, and, and I know there's some dialogue there. Um, but again, I, I don't think that we've seen any actual change in the situation. So while everyone's maybe aware of it, we still haven't seen any action. And as you know, the school buses don't have seat belts, and these are elementary school kids, right? And our kids both ride the bus, and we can make the choice to have them not ride the bus, but then we contribute to the congestion around the Bishop School, right? So that's, if we all made that choice, that's kind of counterproductive as well. So we just feel like some, some quick targeted action would have some measurable safety results in the very near term, and we appreciate you considering that. Thank you very much. I'd just like to let you know that the superintendent, as soon as uh, she's made aware of anything, quickly informs everyone on the committee. Uh, we've been kept abreast of all these things that we are, as you are, uh, very glad no one has got hurt. And we do appreciate the bus driver and uh, everything that's going. And uh, you want to add anything? Can I add public participation? Sure you can. Uh, yes, uh, very aware of it. And I do um, appreciate your recognizing Steve Angelo because he has done a terrific job. These streets right now are not designed for buses the size that we're driving. Mm -hmm. And I know there was a suggestion to perhaps change the, uh, the bus stops, but that, that probably is going to pose more uh, difficulty. I know that there's, uh, we've been in communication with DPW, and by the way, I was going to applaud them. They have just done a fantastic job, as, as have our custodians and maintenance people, trying to deal with these large um, mounds of snow. I have to say the, the big priority recently has been to get the snow off the roof and to, to eliminate icicles so they don't fall on any children. And it's just a, it's a question of some prioritization. But believe me, we're uh, definitely working on that. The other thing that we're, we're, we also want to improve and we're, um, I don't know if it'll be active tomorrow, but it, very soon, is that we're creating an alert now for both bus buses because you could be out there waiting and you wouldn't know that there was going to be a delay mm -hmm. and so we want to create an alert now list for both buses so that we can immediately communicate um, any any concerns or any lateness so we are working on it and we do understand the problem and we we, we knew this was going to be a problem and and anticipated that even a couple weeks ago in mm -hmm. trying to in the bus routes, giving them the giving them the stops that uh, the buses made, and the DPW did everything they could to to clear those out so there would be an indentation and they wouldn't be students wouldn't be standing on the streets. So, 
I appreciate you um, bringing this to all of our attention, but I can assure you it is definitely on our, our, our radar screen. I appreciate that. I, I will say that um, Principal McEnany has been great about sending out emails. And so if you, you know, if you're kind of standing out there and it's 810 and you're freezing, yeah. if you check your smartphone, like he has sent stuff out, the text is an excellent improvement. <coughs> um, if there's been removal at bus stop intersections, I'm un unaware yeah, of it I'm and would of almost that. attest that that has not happened at yeah. the bus stops. Well, um, the, what has happened in general, you've probably seen this in your driveways, you, you shovel them out. And then there's another storm, and the and the plows come down. And so, uh, we can we can talk with DPW about clearing those out again. It's just that you know every time another plow goes down the street, it 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 pushes in to the banks. So so in, in terms of problem solving, they're the experts. But mm -hmm. but certainly the bus seems to have the most trouble with the corners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular, the turn on Irving is, is one I'm familiar with. That's near the bus stop that we mm -hmm. go to. Mm -hmm. Seems to be pretty problematic. Um, and and I, you know, I will note that you know, in terms of specific actions, for example, you know, Matt, Matt Dolan at, uh, at ACC has taken, taken it on himself and, and on their budget to remove, remove snow along Irving to make it safer. Um, but I haven't seen the DPW out there doing it. So um, okay. yeah. look into it. And the, the, and the other thing I would say is that when I spoke to, um, to the head of DPW, I believe now it was two days ago, he, he was unaware that there had been any incident with the bus. Like he, it was not on his radar at all. Hmm. Now, Principal McEnany said he had contacted DPW, and I fully believe that he had, but whatever, and obviously that's not your you know, jurisdiction, but whatever internal communication chain within DPW was not getting it to the right person. Mm -hmm. The safety of the children is all our concern yeah. and uh, we'll continue to look into this. Thank you. And Thank the, you. the last thing I would just say quickly is that we're not coming to you with a hypothetical. The streets are narrow, the corners are bad, there could be an accident. There, there's been at least three incidents. Anyway, so it's, it's not hypothetical, it's, it has happened. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. At this time, uh, we're going into uh, budget discussion. Dr. Bodie. Well, this is an opportunity this evening to um, further our discussion, FY16 budget. But I do want to um, say before we begin that, there was um, um, an observation in the last meeting that perhaps we could take a look at the legal budget. And uh, we have done that and have decided to, <laughs> that we can, looking at actuals and maybe project projections in terms of other possible settlements to reduce um, a couple of the line items. And I'm gonna actually let Diane speak more uh, specifically to that. Okay, um, as you know that over the last several years we've budgeted $200,000 in a legal settlement account, $200,000 in special education legal expenses, and $200,000 in general education legal expenses. So that would include negotiations and employment and things like that. Um, looking at what we've spent, I think, I think it would be fine to reduce um, each of the special ed legal and the general ed legal by $50,000 and the settlement line by $98,000 and that would enable us to fund three more reserve positions. Mm -hmm. Because we know there's already, <coughs> there's already existing pressures on the, existing, on the reserve positions. So it would be really good to have five true reserve positions as opposed to five reserve positions, three of which are spoken for. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would support the idea of moving the money into the reserves, but looking at, and I, on a monthly basis, I get things com coming in. We are markedly down in all our legal expenses. I mean, dramatically so. I hesitate to use that word. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, I think the numbers that you're suggesting, I'd like to be aware, uh, Keep us aware of this during the year, because if we maintain this trend that we're in right now, uh, I'd like to suggest to the committee to revisit this periodically, that this money may be used in other areas uh, of needs of bolstering and putting back programs that we haven't had a chance yet to do. Uh, I think it's conservative. I applaud that. I'm willing to spend money, uh, but uh, I, I will support this at this time going forward. So they're, <clears throat> they're for three reserve positions across the board or for 
Yes. For whatever we may For come whatever up. we need, and, and in fact, for parts of what we may need, because the half cluster at the yeah. middle school will have a ripple effect in specials. If we have to add more classrooms at the elementary, that'll ripple into specials. Mm -hmm. High school scheduling may require little bits and pieces. You know, once you get out of a classroom, it's rarely a whole teacher. It's little right. bits, little bits, little bits. Got it. Right. Thank you. Actually, do we, do we have a clear idea of what those ripples might be? So if we add, you know, three elementary school and so forth, or? It depends on where, oh, right. you know, and what the capacity is in the building. How many specials? Do we have to add another specialist? Do we have to move a specialist from another building? It's really hard to know until we know exactly where the classroom's going to be added. So what about but, the half cluster that we're adding at Audison? Do we have a, are we sufficiently staffed if, if that's all we added at Audison? So. No, what we have added in the budget explicitly was the, the half cluster, mm -hmm. as well as a point for right. additional technology. It, the person is already there, but working part time. Mm -hmm. We need to, to have that as a full time position. But one of the things that happens whenever you add a classroom is that you have to add pieces of specials because otherwise you're going to have really large, large classes. At the elementary level, every time you add a classroom, you're adding another 0.6 at least in terms of specials because you've got a phys, phys actually it's more than 0.6 because we had they have two special ed class um, I'm sorry physical education classes art and music and we have a clear idea of how many classrooms we're going to have at the Audison and we know we're adding this half cluster so can we now say what we'd need to add to support those well we will soon uh, um, we have really accelerated the scheduling in the middle school. Um, scheduled this year because we, we want to see what the impact is going to be on specials. I think that I, I think that we're going to probably end up somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.6 just simply based on the half cluster. But we may find that there are other needs. So when we were looking at reserve positions, we really didn't, we know that they really didn't have five true reserve positions because we knew that we were going to have this effect at Audison, but we just don't know where the effect will be quite yet. We also know that every time you add an elementary classroom, you're adding specialist clothes. So when you, when you have five reserve positions, one classroom will really take up 1.6 in terms of the FTEs of it. The other thing is that we've begun, we will be beginning the high school scheduling, and already we had one position, remember, in the budget, but point four of that was for science. So, you know, we're having an increase of students, well, actually not that many, but it just depends on the new courses and how that all plays itself out. Um, so we would probably be adding pieces here and there. So I, I feel um, much better that we've made this decision uh, with your support, of course, because we, we knew that we didn't have five going into the, the, this new enrollment time. Yes. Uh, we spoke um, at our last meeting about potentially taking of the five. I think, didn't you say something about possibly just saying that three of those were right. elementary? Is that still? Well, we can do that. Uh, what, has been, <coughs> what has been the case historically is that the elementary get the bulk of our reserve positions because we, we don't want classrooms of 30, 35. And yet we have had those in specials at the middle school and we've had them here at the high school as well. Right. The older children, uh, you know, having larger classes. So <coughs> that will probably still be the case, whether we allocate three, designate three elementary, you know, that as we enroll students, that's going to be the first place we look, quite honestly. <coughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> Any questions on that? <coughs> Any more on the budget? Well, th that's what I wanted to let you know. I wanted to respond to you. We did take another look at that, and this is our recommendation. <coughs> um, so we're open to if there's any other, after you had a chance, because last time you, you got it fairly late, and you didn't really have a chance to dig into it, and we just wanted to know tonight what other observations, thoughts you have, or questions. I, I just have one thing. I have a couple of questions dealing with the budget and stuff, but it ties to the technology. So. Do you feel comfortable that the technology plan that's going to be presented tonight we, uh, is funded within the budget? Well, there's a lot of it that's being carried <coughs> in the capital budget. Okay. 
So that, that there, are, there are multiple funnels into our technology plan. Right. There's but, some in this budget. There's a bigger bite in the capital budget. And then there's some from AEF funding that we have a funding stream from them. But correct me if I'm wrong. The AEF and the capital budget usually deals with uh, hardware and so maybe software, not necessarily for courses and uh, support materials and stuff like that. Is that fair to say? Well, capital companies. would be hardware. Yeah. It, my specific question, I'll, I'll jump into it. The T21 grad courses, <coughs> that's something we would be paying for. That's, that's correct. correct. Okay. That's correct. Now it goes back to the question. Do you feel uh, oh, our budget can support that yeah. Yeah. going yeah. forward? Yeah, we had it last year and the year before, and we just carried it forward. Fine. I'll save my other question for the te technology part. Yes. Are there any... In the past, so two weeks ago, we talked about METCO and the kindergarten grant. Is there any other new news that we should be aware of in terms of state funding that should that could impact our revenue stream? Yeah, METCO has been cut another twenty thousand dollars on top of what we already knew. Um, we haven't yet made specific plans about how we're going to respond to that, but we will. Okay. What, what we don't know right now is whether those will remain permanent cuts for next year. And we also don't know whether the reduction. I'm sorry to interrupt. They're going to be. They're going to remain there for. for the foreseeable whether that future. becomes the baseline that they're going to fund next year. Right. Yeah. Right. That becomes the baseline. Now I know that, the Medco budget in general is in the neighborhood of 18 million. Um, Representative Kaufman from Lexington, has asked um, the committee, to fund it at 21 million, which would have been. In fact, I was going to start talking about the tank, which would have been the what it would be at right now if they had had the same increases for the last 10 years as other parts of the budget or as um, as inflation would have had. Well, not inflation, but the kind of increases that other parts of the budget had had. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. It could well be that this becomes a new baseline, and uh, that's that's a sizable reduction. For, for the budget. The other one of a concern, which again goes to the, the whole issue of reserve positions, is that we fund um, the vast majority of our kindergarten t uh, teaching assistance from the kindergarten grant. And that has been reduced this year by 50,000. Um, so we have to figure a way of funding. Obviously, we're not, we're not laying off any of our kindergarten teaching assistance. But um, I, we don't know whether that will be in the new baseline, which means that if we're going to keep, a, a, which we will, uh, a teaching assistant in every kindergarten, we're going to have to dig into these reserve positions for, for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, the thing that uh, I've mentioned on several occasions as being my source of concern is the half cluster in terms of educator quality on uh, split positions between, uh, you say, ELA and social studies or math science. So I'm wondering uh, what steps we're going to take if we go to a half cluster to ensure that uh, the all four content areas have <coughs> wonderful teachers who are able to do yeah. that work. We have two wonderful teachers who are very interested in doing this. Both um, have dual certifications, um, math science or social studies, um, ELA. So one of the things that we are also building into their schedules next year, it's, an, it's sort of a unique opportunity for us to look at inter interdisciplinary projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to be providing an extra period in the day for that. So the whole seventh grade will certainly benefit in the years to come from the work that they're going to do and pilot in this half cluster. And they're both excellent teachers. Okay. I have no concern in that regard. That's whenever you have people teaching two entirely different content areas. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that the people who can do both and do both well are very rare. And if we've got two rare, wonderful teachers there, then I'll support your half cluster. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Else? Unless you have more no. questions. No. <clears throat> I'm easily pleased tonight. Uh, moving on to uh, the uh, Karen. Technology. Can you, technology. Can you bring it? Can you bring yes, it? Yes. Thank you. Oh. Oh, I, I guess 
<laughs> way ahead of schedule, so that's the... Excuse me. No, it's me. It's me. Do you have a click of that? I do. Thank you. The, uh, As she's bringing up the um, uh, presentation, I wanted to let you know that um, last evening we had um, a forum for parents of uh, secondary school students, so middle school and high school at the <coughs> Audison. Um, I think given the weather and the cold and uh, you know conflicting, I heard there was a girls varsity um, uh, hockey game last night and they won in overtime. So um, it was a small group but very interested group and we'll be rescheduling the one for the elementary school um, that we uh, did not have doesn't want to seem to work from here. Can, can I ask you to? Oh, pointing at the thing. Can you just maybe move the stick? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, did it work? Not yet. <coughs> Try it now. Thanks. No, Diane's going to be my technical. She's going to be my Vanna White She's tonight. Be your Thank you. Uh, uh, so we'll be rescheduling the meeting for the elementary school so uh, so we have uh, time for parents to also I, I, I sort of want to get a handle on when I think the parking lots are going to support <laughs> people coming in um, so it will be shortly um, tonight I want to just tell you that when we started our technology plan we don't start with an idea like we want iPads or we want Chromebooks or we want laptops what we start with is our educational vision and um, this is a, a statement of what the overarching vision is um, and any decisions that we make regarding technology and how it's used in the um, instruction how it's used to support instruction um, are based on this overarching vision next slide please um, Again, we just wanted to emphasize that too often people think of technology um, as sort of like an electronic substitution, and we are really looking for technology to assist us in redefining how we do school so that we can raise um, the level of critical thinking that we're asking students to do, um, the project-based learning that we're asking students to do all together. I'm, I'm not going to show this video tonight, but if you would like to uh, at another time, you can take a look at this video that talks more in detail about the framework that we use. But it's referred to as the SAMR model. S stands for substitution, A for augmentation, M stands for modification, and R stands for redefinition. And it's very similar to um, the Bloom's taxonomy, where you go from uh, just recall at the bottom all the way up to creation and, and uh, using evaluations skills so um, <clears throat> let's let's talk about what this looks like in in Arlington what does it really mean to have uh, to use technology to redefine how we do things in the classroom so at an elementary school in Arlington students read a book they then read, uh, wrote their own book in the same style as the author using um, an application called book creator they published and shared these books with their families using kid blog so not just the parents could read um, the story that comes home on a piece of paper, but um, relatives, grandparents, aunts and uncles throughout the country and the, actually in, throughout the world can share in these books and the families can also comment on these books. They then used Skype uh, to share with the author in real time their books. They read some of their books aloud. The author was so impressed that she scheduled a visit to the classroom when she came to Boston on a book tour. Students then went one step further and they recorded themselves reading their books aloud and uh, using a QR code um, when other students come in with their iPads they're able to hear them and see them read the books aloud um, so this is a way where we really making teaching and learning public and we find that by making um, this work public the, the students become more engaged in writing more and doing a better quality work because it's not just going to go up on the refrigerator but it's now um, given to the world technology as we've talked about before is deeply embedded into the common core and it requires uh, students as young as kindergarten to be able to use it for researching and collaborating <coughs> and publishing and truly when we get to the end of the k-12 experience we're looking for a high school graduate um, that is truly digital proficient again the common uh, core state standard um, really calls for students to be able to employ technology across their educational experience and to be able to select tools thoughtfully 
They knew, use it not only in literacy, but also in numeracy, there, and, and also in science as well. Um, they need to be able to create m digital models to analyze data, um, to pose uh, problems, pose solution to those problems, um, and to make it part of the educational experience. So the context for our technology plan um, is sort of driven by th <coughs> these parameters. And technology is changing rapidly, and I know that I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. So specific hardware choices on the close-in years are much easier to make than those on the outer years. And so therefore, that's why we tie all our decisions to that educational vision. So it's not tied to a specific um, piece of hardware or software, um, but rather to those capabilities that we want to have our students to do. But one of the trends that we do see is moving more um, from what used to be the computer lab model where students would go in maybe once a week or once every two weeks or every three weeks <coughs> to use um, a computer and then get marched back to the classroom. And now we're looking at much more mobile devices. And our secondary students need to experience um, online and blended learning experiences. Blended learning would be those classes that have some face-to-face -face classroom experience and then some assignments that are done online um, because that's the way um, many colleges and universities are going and we need to prepare our students to be able to handle that. It requires a student to be much more um, self-motivated and be able to work independently and um, so that's an experience that we really want to have for all of our secondary students and hopefully starting as, as young as middle school. We've made some uh, recent investments in technology, and we generally do this by the pilot, evaluate, and expand model. So we will pilot something um, in a cluster or in a classroom or in a school, and then based on that, we'll evaluate whether we um, have the results from that experience that we wanted to have, uh, try to get the bugs out with as little people as possible, um, and then expand that model. And we've been doing that across the district for the past three years. Um, we've seen our need for professional development to increase, um, and we want to make sure that technology not only is used during instruction, but is also in support instruction. And finally, the security of our data, whether it just be a student's piece of work or something is um, more uh, um, confidential, a student's grades, et cetera, the, the security of our student data is paramount, and it is something that we um, care about deeply. So just to give you an overview of what happened during the 2014-2015 school year, um, these are the hardware purchases that we made. Um, primarily this year we focused on upgrading teachers. While we did upgrade some student machines, we really wanted to upgrade the teachers so that they would be able to utilize all the tools that we have necessary to analyze data to impact student achievement. Um, we also, as we talked about, are having some parent forums. We'll be having some separate parent outreach for middle and high school parents that are interested in what we call bring your own device, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. We've met with local companies to talk about what kind of STEM skills, uh, programming skills, what languages do our students need to have in order to get <coughs> internships and to um, go successfully into college careers in the, in the STEM areas. And, and we will be having a technology showcase. This is our third annual sh technology showcase at the high school on 4-13-15. Uh, as I said, technology is woven um, deeply into our curriculum and, and STEM also, the STEM curriculum. So we not only use it in all curriculum areas, that's the teaching with technology, but we also have teaching of technology. And so we start as young as uh, programming, as young as using Scratch Junior at several of the classrooms in Thompson, to digital modeling, which we expanded this year at the middle school, and we've expanded computer science at the high school. Our ultimate goal would be that students would have the skills that when they came into high school, they would have the first year of computer science and then would be able to take AP computer science um, as they get into their sophomore year. These are some of the professional development experiences and the support um, that we've done. We have a task force that's working on policies for if we allow students to bring their own device into the school. Um, those, will, those devices, I just want to add, will not 
be everything <coughs> under the sun. We'll have um, a fairly short list of devices that students will be able to bring in the school, and we'll have parameters in terms of the kinds of filters and the safety software and virus protection that students would be able to have because we're going to be putting those devices on our network. Right now, the students are only allowed to get on the guest network. Um, next year, we'll, in very limited cases, we'll be allowing students to bring devices in and put them on our network. Um, we're working with the staff at both the Audison and the high school, um, and we've provided PD to both groups to try to um, get a better picture about what the appropriate devices would be um, and the appropriate utilization and curriculum at the middle school and high school. As I said, we don't just use technology in the instruction, but also in support of learning. Um, right now, we have a piece of student analytics software that we're using primarily at the elementary school, and we've um, given a lot of training to the elementary teachers, and we're gonna continue to do so. When we look towards next year, um, in terms of hardware, um, we'll be looking more at student devices, and the vast majority of the purchases uh, next year will be to replace machines that are greater than four years old that are being used by students, and in some cases uh, in, in uh, three years old. Um, we are not really looking to um, provide new devices in the sense that we will um, be replacing whole computer labs um, with the same kind of equipment that's already there, but rather that we'll be going to more of those mobile labs um, that we talked about. In terms of curriculum, we'll be continuing to expand the uh, STEM curriculum at the elementary school. Um, we want to make sure that all Audison students get at least uh, one quarter of digital modeling. In that class, students learn sequential thinking, they learn programming, they learn how to create um, uh, websites, and uh, learn a little bit about gaming and animation. Um, these are skills that all students um, can benefit from. We'll also be expanding um, the AP computer science classes again at the high school. In terms of technology to support learning, we hope that we'll be moving more to um, some uh, electronic assessments. A lot of teachers are using these on their own right now. They create little Google Forms or other types of formative assessments. Um, explain everything is something that teachers use for a formative assessment um, and summative assessment. Um, we will hopefully be expanding our baseline uh, analytics software to the middle school. We'll continue to use Edwin Analytics, which is provided by the state for us to analyze our MCAS data. And the one thing that we're most excited about is that we've asked some of our teachers that are our lead teachers, our mentor teachers, our teachers who provide professional development across the district, if we can come in and um, videotape their classroom. And we'll be creating a library of exemplars for our teachers to use across the district, which eventually, in the next year after that, will hopefully go to blended learning experiences. And we, we sort of have one going on right now, but we really want to tap into blended learning and online learning for our teachers because many times teachers want to participate in something but due to family commitments or a longer commute they're not able to um, participate in that and you know as we say a picture is worth a thousand words and so in seeing someone do something and the feed that's what the feedback that we're getting now seeing someone actually um, implementing a Lucy Calkins uh, lesson goes a long way um, we will continue to have our lead technology teachers at each of the schools. As I said, we've run already two T21 courses, which is a graduate level blended learning course for our teachers, and we'll be running one again at the middle and high school. And we'll be continuing to implement and revise our bring your own device policies. And uh, we will increase our instructional technology uh, support people. And I don't mean people who actually support the device, but those people who work with um, teachers in the classroom um, to better understand how they might use it over time. And to look at the 2016-2017 school year, again, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, expanding our, our um, mobile model um, that we're going to continue to offer as long as we have a demand for that uh, technology class. We'll continue to refine our BYOD policies. Um, right now, it's our plan. It looks like that would be right about the time period to um, perhaps come back to the committee to talk about creating a graduation requirement that students would take at least one blended um, learning or online learning class for all graduates. We really want to emphasize the, the expansion of tech and engineering and digital modeling at the middle school and create um, expanded STEM opportunities for all elementary students. 
and that's it. Questions? Yes. Uh, so I was at the presentation last night, and I am excited about what's <coughs> happening. I think it's a nice balance between both leaping ahead, but being cautious and doing some studies and, and figuring out what works. Um, to that end, I was wondering um, what sort of feedback we've gotten or, or plan to get from teachers about both about what works or what their ideas are or you know their suggestions. Um, how we, we reach out to those stakeholders? The um, lead technology teachers meet once a month. Part of their um, role is to bring forward suggestions, problems, concerns, ideas from the schools that they are resident in. Um, in addition to that, I've been meeting with focus groups at the middle school um, and also at the high school uh, to talk to teachers about you know, their ideas, their concerns, their problems. Mm -hmm. um, it really has helped us to understand that the biggest problem with our network wasn't the network, it was really the access points. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine the highway was just fine with the number of lanes that it had, um, but the on-ramps were Hard too ramp. skinny. Mm -hmm. So now we have better on-ramps and we're getting much better um, feedback from teachers regarding okay. Okay. The internet. And, and I just have one more question. Um, I know one of the, the things that the elementary uh, level teachers came to us with um, in their budget request was to ask for <coughs> software to do better analysis of MCAS scores. And I was wondering, do we feel that baseline edge analytics and the Edwin analytics is sufficient for our needs, or do we still think that you know, later on there's another thing that we should be using that we may not be able to afford right now? Well, both those tools, I think, will allow us to look at um, MCAS data as well as local formative assessment data. I think what they were asking for was whether there was possible another tool out there, and we're, we are continuing to investigate that, that would allow us to actually do the measurement. So it's not the analyzing of the data, but actually some kind of online assessment tool, perhaps, I that see. can speed up the feedback process. And we're constantly looking at that. Okay. But if it's out there, someone's going to make a lot of money off it because it's not as easy to find as you might think. Oh, I thought they had identified something that they found. No, they had, they had not. Okay. They were hoping we'd find something, and we, we, we're looking constantly. Ms. Starks? Um, I wondered if uh, CIAA had reviewed this. Did this ever, did this go through that subcommittee? This the, the uh, curriculum, technology, yeah. curriculum technology. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. It, but it can. It's it's uh, what we've been trying to do is is solicit a, solicit comments, and um, I think that once we have comments from here from parents, we can you know bring this to the bring this to the committee. Uh, this is just a draft plan at this point, and we're really getting people's feedback on it. This is not the final plan. Right. Right. Uh, it's very similar they, to what we've discussed yeah. in the past. There's not any right. major groundbreaking changes from what we've discussed last year and the year before. But we had not had a formalized process for people to provide input, so <coughs> we really wanted to do that. The plan is that the draft version of the plan has actually been on the district website, I think, at least three weeks, if not longer than that right now. Cool. Um, and my other question was, like, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1, we can easily achieve this, and 10, there is no way we can achieve this. How? In terms of funding, is that what you're asking Realistic me? is this, um, just in general, anything. Um, are there, what obstacle, I guess, that maybe what are the other question is, what are the obstacles to making this happen at all? Like, whether it's funding, whether it's the existence of what we want, or? Um, I think the existence of what we want is, is certainly there. I think that, that we did the right um, plan or the right expansion plan by, as, as um, Ms. Sue said, that, that we you know went fast but went slow in the sense that we built momentum, and but we um, were very cautious about what we did. Um, certainly, funding is all, all, always a concern. Um, uh, when I met with the Capital Committee last year, um, we actually they asked for a four or five year plan, um, which I ca came to them with. Um, they generously funded last year. Mm -hmm. They also generously funded this year. Um, I think you know it's always going to depend on what the Capital Committee has available. I mean, we're talking about the vast, the big monies um, being capital. Um, I have to say that. It's getting, technology is getting to the point that it's um, not a nice to have anymore. It's, it's, 
it's a definite got to have in terms of education. And so we look at those other things. For example, we've been going to digital textbooks mm -hmm. or, you know, we can find um, uh, simulators for graphing calculators. So if we were going to buy, I mean, most students at the high school level now bring their own graphing calculator. So that's just one example. But wherever possible, we look at where we can cut back in other things in order to um, to be able to afford our expansion of technology. So I would say funding is probably the biggest thing. And to a small amount, I would, you know, would be nice to have, um, we have somebody at the high school that helps teachers um, in their classrooms. We have a person that works with the elementary school. She also does the middle school. Um, it would be nice to have somebody that might part, might do some work at the middle school. We, we have someone who's graciously given a lot of her time after school and on her prep periods of volunteer to work with teachers. Um, I don't think it's, it's holding us back right now, but there, if we really want to get everybody on board, that might be something that we look at down the line. It wouldn't be a full time, it would be a piece of a person. Yeah, make a comment. Sure. Assuming a positive vote of town meeting on the capital sure. budget, Next year will be a 10 in terms of whether we can achieve this. The years out depends upon, again, the amount of money. I think one of the things that we are seeing is an appetite and an interest mm -hmm. in, a, in, in teachers using the devices, but the, if you have one iPad card shared at a grade, that, that, is, that, is, that can be a, a little bit of a struggle in terms of how you you use it so I think that is the one thing that will increase is the interest in it the wanting to do it but perhaps the limitation um, the other issue um, that Dr. Chesson had just alluded to is the support we have when you think of the number of devices that exist in the district today it has just grown so much thanks to the generosity AEF and capital that we have very relatively few um, support people that exist and we and we even have less in the terms of instructional technology we have really half a person that is dealing with all of our elementary thank goodness we have our teachers who are become teacher leaders in this field because otherwise this would be untenable will we need more support in the years to come most likely so that will be things we'll have to consider as a committee and, it's, and then it's weighed against all the other needs that we have. Right, no, mm -hmm. I know, as a, as a teacher, I mean, someone we were just having this conversation at my school and they said, well, you know, what would you need to, why don't you use the computers or the iPads in your classes more? And I said, because they're not in my class. Mm -hmm. I have to sign up for them, I have to, that means that I have to find the cart in the morning, <coughs> which is never where it's supposed to be, mm -hmm. and then, you know, I have to hope that they're all working and that someone left it plugged in. You know, if it were in my room and I had it and I owned it, I would have them, I would have the kids on them every day. I said, right. but, you know, it's, it's a hassle when you don't have enough, and I understand that problem, but I also know that we do have, we have a full-time technology support person just for teachers not not for the hard we have technology support people for the hardware and we have technology support people for the teachers like there's a full-time person just in our building for our school so i know yeah. that that's yeah we have a half a person for k8 yeah, right and we have two hardware support people for all of our elementary schools yeah two, it's two. yeah, yeah. True. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things that we've had to do because of that, uh, first of all, we're very lucky and that between the generosity of the AEF and um, years that it didn't snow, uh, we're getting very close at the elementary to have one cart per every two teachers or every three teachers, which makes a difference. Yeah. And last night I also alluded to the fact that there's a huge difference in the students' respect for the equipment mm -hmm. when they utilize it more often than yes. if they use it mm -hmm. on, a, a, on a rare basis. Um, and we are very lucky in this district, we've seen very little breakage. But one of the things that we found that works out really well is in the schools that don't have one-to-one -one is that we put somebody sort of in the charge of the care and feeding of the cart and they get to keep it in their room if they volunteer to care and feed it. Mm -hmm. And so th that person is very motivated to make sure things are plugged in, et cetera, because they get to keep it in the room. So if nobody comes to look for it, they got it they for that it. day. Right, so, right, yeah. right. That's worked yeah. out really well for us. That's great. Also. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any thought to do bulk purchasing for computers on the secondary level like universities and colleges do and offer them at, at a bulk purchase rate? We already buy them off the state contract, so we're taking advantage of the price and leverage through the okay, state. Okay, I guess what I'm asking. talking about reselling? He's talking about students. To the parents. The parents. Oh, to the parents. To the parents. parents. Yeah, in other words, when my daughter, I'll tell you how old she was, when she went to Syracuse 20 years ago almost, uh, she, uh, she was required to buy a computer at that time. And, but it was a fraction of the cost it would have cost us on our own. That's well, I don't know about a fraction of the cost, but um, we met with It was with 50%. The, oh, well, I, I don't know of any company that d does that now. Maybe, okay. uh, maybe Syracuse was getting a deal then. Um, Apple will um, provide to higher education, parents who buy a, a computer for their students who are going to college get an, um, an educational discount, but it's not allowed to be purchased for K through 12 right now, but they're in the process of, to educators, yes, but for students, not so much. So um, we met with them this week, and they're in the process of taking a look at that. They're also looking at their leasing structure, which is what a lot of districts have right. gone to. Um, the Apple does not provide leases to individual people, um, but many districts right. have started to go to leasing structures. Okay. And looking at the, the other document you provided us, talked about an aging Chromebook. Uh, to me, a Chromebook is just... How does it age? Is it the physical aging or are you? Uh, are the yeah, it's been around. It's, okay, it's, it's not, one of the few. It's, it's breaking down. Yes, it's breaking it's physically down. Physically breaking down. It's, it's physically not the quality breaking of down. The, the software that's involved because it's very limited software on a Chromebook. Right, it's really okay. the fact that the, it's that the uh, it's device. It's losing its hair? The Chromebooks that are breaking down our districts are the ones that they gave us. Yeah. I, I, and I, I think there's I a little just, bit of a, a planned obsolescence with them. I think that the ones that we've purchased are doing well. Are doing I, better. Usually when you, when you think about aging in computers, you're talking about the, uh, the ability for it to function <coughs> in today's world. And the, because the Chromebook is, has limited... Uh, well, the, the operating I system understand. might it, not be able okay. to be updated. My, I, I have a very... The bring your own device um, and with the... And I don't want to overemphasize it to, to give anybody ideas, but the, the adaptability of students to uh, circumvent securities and things of this nature. I'm, I'm very concerned about security on devices we do not control directly. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming in, bringing well, that we in. would be controlling them because they, in order to go on our network, they have to go in our Active Directory. So, in in effect, we monitor while they're in the building what's going on. Okay, so they they sign a document in the building when they the leave access. the building. The teach the right. student can do whatever the parent allows. But we have we have to control and. Uh, you may have already answered this. Do we lease or we purchase all our equipment at this time? Right now, we purchase all our equipment. We're, we're looking into some lease options. How about maintenance? Is that done in-house or do we purchase maintenance agreements? We are self-indemnified. Um, which means? Which means that nothing. we right, do our own. <coughs> However, the, the, for example, on an Apple Care, on, um, on a iPad, the cost of an iPad is $379. Well, the Apple Care is $100. So per, per device? Per device. So we l made the decision three years ago that we could take that money that we would have spent on AppleCare and buy extra devices and then just swap them out if a kid has a problem with the device. So just to clarify, the, we, you're not looking for a vote tonight? Uh, no. Okay. And uh, you'll be coming back at, at a later date? We, at a later date, we would probably um, want you to endorse, approve this plan. And uh, we need to go through the elementary um, forum, and we can also go to the subcommittee uh, and have them take a look at it as well. But we will probably, certainly will be a month out at least before it's ready for your approval. I, this comes from the capital, some, some comes from the capital budget, or all of it, what percentage, what percentage can we get from the capital budget? Well, we get well, like 400,000. Yeah, 425,000 next yes, year, Yes, yes. 420, it's, it's Bulk. And then how much is AEF? Is um, well, AEF is their goal is to raise 150,000. They've raised um, equal to that over the last two years. Um, so, you know. But we may not be spending it all next yeah, year. I, I get right. it. Yeah. So it's a $525,000. In that vicinity, in the 500 probably. I just want to make sure that I'm clear that to I, replace the devices that we currently have in place on a three to four year cycle, just to replace is in the neighborhood of 350000 to $400,000. Got it. Okay. And how much are we budgeting beyond those two in our budget? 
We're not budgeting for hardware. We have, a, we have a little no, dribs and drabs for hardware. for hardware. We have software costs in the budget. Okay. Software costs and PD. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, proposed new elementary schedule. Dr. Bodie. Absolutely. Thank you. Tonight I want to um, present to you a proposal um, that the negotiating team has been discussing for the last couple of months. Normally, when you're in negotiations, you don't go public with any of the aspects of discussion. But the reason why we are right now is that um, this, poten this potential proposal, and it's really just right now in that, at that level, um, would have an effect um, on next, could potentially have an effect on next year that I think that is important for the committee as well as parents to understand. In fact, um, we've already done a presentation for elementary teachers and are gathering their feedback on the, the, some of the points of, the, uh, the, of this proposal. So tonight is really just a very high level um, discussion of what is being considered. We're not getting into much of the detail of it. As I said, this is still very much a part of the negotiation session, but trying to find, to get some comments on it. One of the things that we will be looking for as we gather information from um, teachers, we also want to be gathering information from parents. And there'll be two mechanisms for how that can happen. One, of course, is through uh, public participation at the school committee meetings over the next uh, the next meeting or even potentially the, the second meeting in March. Another is that I'm going to create a drop box and I will send that information out to parents uh, with a you know, one sheet summary of the key points of this um, next week sometime so that um, they are aware that they can give us some feedback as well. And I, and I think that some feedback that uh, I've already heard will help us try to develop um, the very best plan that we can. But let me, let me just give you the, the rationale and some of the, the key ideas here in this plan. The, the core reasons for considering this is, is something that we've been hearing from teachers for the last, for many years actually. And that is that they, they really do need more time to, to plan with each other. And as much as elementary principals work to, to have teachers scheduled at the same time for their, common pl for their pr preparation time, it's, it's really very difficult to always achieve that. Uh, and certainly uh, a, the, they are able to do it a couple times a week, but it's, what makes it difficult is in terms of our block scheduling, but even more importantly, the way we schedule specialists. Um, but, but even when we're able to provide common planning times through the, the teacher's prep period, it's very difficult for them to collaborate with special education teachers because they may be teaching at that time or uh, e ELL teachers, um, reading teachers, literacy uh, and math coaches. So the way we're doing it right now provides very limited opportunities for teachers to collaborate. The other issue is that, for example, this year, um, we, listening to this need, and we've recognized it as well, we have provided a traveling group of three uh, substitutes that go from school to school on a rotating basis so that we can provide time for teachers at a grade level to meet together, to look at data, and, and to do common planning. But it, while it's achieving that goal, at the same time, it means that Teachers um, are out of the classroom. They're having to create sub plans if they if they don't use the plans that the substitutes bring, and it's just a disruption to the day. So what we're looking for are fewer disruptions in the school day, the year, um, and we're looking for more consistency in, in being able to schedule. So these are a lot of the core reasons here, and so when when we talk about teachers coming together to do common planning time. 
it's really um, essential. In fact, <coughs> it's extremely important that teachers have this time for collaboration. Um, they need time to plan the curriculum, to plan flexible groups. They need time to be able to integrate literacy uh, into social studies and science. They need time to develop many of the activities that go into the flexible grouping. So if you have three kindergarten teachers at grade two that want to do flexible grouping once or twice a week, you have to have time to be able to figure out who's going to be in each group because that's going to change from week to week and what the activities are going to be in those flexible groups for mathematics or for that matter for um, ELA, for English. So it's essential and we just simply don't have enough time for, for teachers to have that. So by, in this proposal, let me just mention sort of what the proposal is because I keep talking about the proposal. The proposal is to have a early release day every week. And we'll talk more about what it will look like in a second. But that is the idea. Um, for teachers, it would also mean more opportunities to work with math coaches as a group. It could provide more opportunities for vertical planning in a school because even though right now teachers may be able to plan together at a grade level, there is very little opportunity uh, except for maybe one hour after school for a PLC to do vertical planning. We also want, want to make sure that we are going to be able to maintain um, our content PD. Over the last number of years, we have, we recognize how important this is. If you're going to have a consistent curriculum across the whole district, you need to be able to have a whole grade level meet together and to um, work with um, and have professional development in the content. Well, we have taken whole classes out during the school day, but, but one of the challenges of doing that is substitutes. And sometimes we can't get enough substitutes. And a particular school may be having a lot of people absent, so teachers aren't able to come. So there are a lot of problems in, in trying to provide this. We do do it on the early release days. And in fact, we have, as you've seen, the schedule for the year, we had the eight content days. Well, this just this year, in January and February, we've lost two content days, mm -hmm. and there's no way to make them up. In this particular proposal, we would be able to make them up by doing some shifting around. So um, the other thing is that, again, as I said, the, we've had these data meetings, but um, they, they're on a rotating basis, but we like to have a, a, you know, a, a set amount of time that also we can have ELL teachers attend, special education teachers, the nurse if necessary. So it gives us more of an opportunity to have um, a bigger group. Administrators, um, they, they don't, while they make every effort to attend the data meetings and to attend, if, if necessary, common planning, if, if, the, if that um, is, seems appropriate, they need more uh, an opportunity to be able to attend um, these grade level meetings and they need to be able to attend data meetings but just the normal flow of the of issues that could come up in school could prevent that. We also um, need more flexibility in scheduling specials. I, I cannot begin to tell you how much time is spent every year trying to schedule specials. It's it's a huge effort and of course one of the things that happens in the summer you add one more class and it totally disrupts the entire scheduling because we share specialists among schools so we we i won't go into the details of why this is going to make it easier but i i i know we we all know that are involved in scheduling that this will be make it much easier um the other thing that sometimes um, does not happen is monthly building meetings and this would also ensure that as well. So what would this proposed new schedule look like? Um, we would have uh, a new bell schedule from 8, 10 to 2.30. So the school day would be technically about 15 minutes longer. We, we, on our website you'll notice you'll, it'll see the school day starts at 8.15 but the fact of the matter is bells at all the schools that are 8.10. Um, we would have an early release day at 1 o'clock 
um, in all of our elementary schools. <coughs> and teachers uh, then would be meeting uh, uh, until about 3 o'clock. And we have a proposed schedule for what that would look like so that everybody can sort of see graphically how things could put, be put together, common planning time with data meetings, with building meetings, with content, and um, have been very careful about it. But it's not a final schedule yet, just basically an idea. So the reason for bringing this up tonight is that I think that if, if this were to be implemented next year, and again, this is part of negotiations, it has to go through ratification process with teachers as well as the school committee, um, we all felt that it's such, a, it's such a major change in how we have organized our elementary day that we do want parents to be aware of it early on and to have an opportunity to give us some feedback. I will say that I have been in contact, um, I wish the administration has been in contact with um, our after school programs and this will work fine. Um, it's a little bit of a wash in time in terms of how it's distributed in the week because the days are longer some days of the week but you know they're shorter on, at, on the one release day. I've also uh, looked, talked with our daycare providers and this will work as well. So we're, we're looking at all the different aspects uh, that might be um, of issue here, but certainly one of them and why we're talking about tonight is communication with, um, with the committee as well as with um, the, com uh, the parents of the community. So this is just the overview. At some point we will go into more, but, but th that's where we are at this point. Anyone on the committee have anything they'd like to say at this time? I'd like to just mention, as the old man on the committee, 42 years ago when I did my student teaching here in Arlington, there was this exact same program in effect. Uh, Lexington has maintained that. And uh, as a, a retired teacher uh, at an elementary level, I see tremendous benefits uh, serving this. Uh, I appreciate this will be an adjustment for parents, but uh, it's, it's a scheduled time, it's, it's there, uh, may take a, little, a few bumps to get get used to, but I personally think this will be something very beneficial to the system. Chris? Um, where, where I teach in Lexington, they have this on Thursdays, um, and I was talking to some of the elementary teachers about what they thought about it, and also parents, because, you know, I know that it is a change. Um, and um, they actually said that once you get used to it, knowing that you have that, the nice thing is that you can, you know, you deal, you get your daycare down or whatever, but also that, you know, that way they can um, make appointments. But the teachers in particular um, makes us middle school teachers jealous because um, it gives them time. They really do have time to meet with all of those people that don't typically have time together. You know, when I'm teaching, that means that the specialists are off, and when the specialists are teaching, I'm off. And so, you know, we rarely get to meet, and yet they have this time in the afternoon, and they feel like it's really been beneficial um, to the kids, to the curriculum, to kind of just making it much more cohesive um, there. And so I think there are definitely a lot of precedents in other districts for this as well. Mr. Slickman. Not only, you know, not only that, but the, this, the choreography of doing this just rearranges things so that you can do so much more in terms of getting teachers together and to do the common planning time and do, to do the reflect, reflective practice that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, having had to put together elementary schedules, it's always so difficult to get it in a way that, that it's going to work for the specialists and for the teachers and to get the pl common planning time in. This design packages the common planning time and will also, uh, sounds like it's going to result in uh, more coherent instructional time with fewer interruptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will also keep, um, we're still significantly above the um, requirement for mm -hmm. hours of instruction. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention, uh, and you look at this, the actual four days a week, the day has been extended to offset mm -hmm. the early release time. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 time-wise, it's, it, it's a wash. Uh, the uh, each four days, yeah, I think it's 20, 20, it's 20, 20 minutes, minutes. Uh, added to the current time, and then the early release on Tuesday. So uh, actual classroom time has not been diminished. Uh, 
I want to make that clear. It's it's sitting there, but uh, it's been it's been rearranged. And I, I I have to say when I've talked, what well, we actually talked to the uh, after school programs, they liked it because it's consistent. I think one of the things that's been challenging for parents is that one month you have an early release day on this day, but then the other day other days of the month, this is just consistent. And it would be from the first Tuesday of the school year to the end. Um, and I, I think that in some ways, at least that's the feedback we have from our after school programs, that they actually will prefer this in terms of their staffing. Oh, one more question. And sure. there will be no other mm -hmm. half days. No. Parents need to also understand the, that the only there thing will be I will no other half days there, for no conference. There is, well, there's no other half days, but there'll be two half days in late November, December. We haven't just worked this out where the, the early release will be at 11.15, as we've always done for conferences. We have, to, we have to be able to provide the elementary level, which has been our, what we've always done, is 20 minutes for conferences. So we have to actually create 20 minutes worth of time. Now, in this new model, one of the things that will change is it will give teachers a lot more flexibility when they want to schedule conferences. But in terms of providing the time, we have to provide the time. Correct me, there's still a curriculum day at the secondary level, a full, uh, another release day? There is a professional day. It's okay. an all-day professional okay. day. That is on, no, the, it's a Monday, first Monday in November. I do want to emphasize what we are showing and discussing tonight is at the elementary level mm -hmm. only, mm -hmm. not at the middle school or at the high school. Uh, it's been said, but I just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. We all say yes. Oh, um, just that I um, I suspect this will be uh, good for some parents and not as good for others. Mm -hmm. as, as any changes, um, I just hope that people appreciate that by giving teachers more opportunity to meet with each other, that that will increase um, teaching and learning for their kids, and that that's a really valuable thing that we all I think appreciate. I, I think that it, I I think I'm glad you said that because I think that it's, it will be a significant change in terms of of mm -hmm. the effect for our students and that's really what is honestly that's really what's motivating this what is the best way that we can provide the kind of resources that students will benefit from and the best resource we can give them is highly trained teachers who have done a lot of very good planning about instruction All set? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Bodhi, superintendent's report? Yes. Uh, actually, I have a lot, Mr. Hainer. I saw. <laughs> All right. You're taking advantage of our, our time. All right. Well, first of all, our snow situation. I think I may be talking about that for a while. I, I do. I, I do want to take every opportunity to thank um, our custodians and maintenance um, people as well as DPW. It has been a, quite a team effort um, to be able to keep our schools um, clear for safety. And one of the most important things we've done over the vacation was clear roofs. We had at one point 70 people that were hired well, in addition, I should say 70 total, some were hired for that, for this purpose, was shoveling snow off roofs. And uh, because, you know, that would be a danger if some of this, first of all, whether it would, the weight would build would take it, but I think structurally we'd be fine on that. It was more really what would be happening if they, the snow started sliding off the roofs around children. Not to mention all the icicles had to be removed, and some of them were quite immense because we didn't want anything falling. So that was really the focus last week and, and Dr. Chesson was um, the point person for that um, as, we, as we worked through it. Um, you know, it remains a challenge to just to get good drop-off cycles at the, school, at the elementary schools in particular. I think the high school and the middle school are going fairly well. Um, it, it doesn't take much for a, a clog up to happen at the elementary, though I was at one of our elementary, in fact, was Bishop to this morning, and I was pleasantly surprised that, the, that we must be getting in a better pattern because the lines were not as significant as they've been for the first couple of days. So that is happening, and 
well, one of the things we're also starting to see are leaks, and you just need to be aware of that. We, we had, um, we have some, we've had a couple of them. As, as what's happening on roofs is in, where they hadn't been completely shoveled, and water had gathered, and they come seeping through. So we've been having a few buckets at some, at some schools. But I think um, shoveling the snow off the roofs will make a big difference when we start getting the melt. And that was one of the, the safety was the concern, but also the potential for weight. And then thirdly, what happens if we don't and there's all these puddles of water accumulate. <coughs> so um, I know that the DPW would like to be able to get to intersections and, and reduce these, um, these mounds, and that's certainly something that remains a priority for them. And hopefully we have um, some uh, reprieve from these bigger storms. It looks like anything we get are more dustings in the near future. But I will, we, I, I again, I want to iterate about the Bishop bus. We are concerned about that, that these buses are just are having a, are, are struggling. And if somebody tries to pass them, um, the, it, it, when they drive to the side, it wasn't so much a, it was a snowbank at, at Bishop, but another car tried to get by it and it pulled over and then got stuck but fortunately it was right there so we will we will address that as best as we can so the first thing um oh i did want to mention one more thing about this because um, there has been some concern about parking at the schools and the availability of play space for children and I'm not sure that this is going to change anytime soon because these roads are so narrow. If we have around the schools teachers parking on the street, and first of all, there's a parking ban still remaining in much of Arlington, a fire truck can't go by. That's the problem. And so we have to keep uh, teacher and staff cars off the streets around the schools. And so we've had to use blacktops at some of the schools and fire lanes as well. But that's been with the actually the suggestion of um, our fire chief. So what has happened though is that we've got cars parked on blacktops and you have really deep snow in fields nearby and so you know it's, it's been uh, more depending on the elementary school it's been a little bit more of a struggle in terms of getting outside for recess and, and, I, and I know that people want that to happen and are trying to have it happen but uh, I think that one of the problems is of just having the, the, the safe space to do it. In some schools, they're having, trying to take the kids on walks in which they know that there's a clear walkway to walk to. So we're aware of that, and I just, we just have to all be patient about this. Um, I will say, having been in some classrooms today, kids are a little bit more nudgy <laughs> <laughs> than I noticed earlier. Uh, so I, I, and we have Ms. Foley here, and she probably can speak to that as well. <laughs> So we'd like to get them out and siphon off some of this energy, but um, we want to have it be safe. Yeah, my dog feels the same way. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all feel the same way on this. Yeah. He does. Yeah. He wants to get out. Okay, so moving on, um, one of the, uh, we've, we've already talked about some of the METCO proposed cuts, and you know, they really do impact the services we um, can offer. And uh, Metco Inc. and Metco Board have been working, uh, going through an iteration of a letter that they're asking superintendents and school boards um, to sign. And I sent that the, the letter to you, um, basically asking the governor not to to not have the cuts that he's proposing. But certainly, I think the bigger message is about next year, that this doesn't become a baseline uh, for future funding for uh, the METCO program. Yesterday I attended a, um, an event sponsored by Jay Kaufman um, at the State House to, uh, in, to show, uh, sh basically a show of support to other, other legislators about the METCO program. And uh, so I offer this to you and I was wondering if as a committee you would like to have the Arlington School Committee be an added name onto the letter. So moved. <coughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. 
Yeah, I will so. I will get that out tonight, in fact, so that they know, because tomorrow is going to be the last day for the signatures. Um, I also want to re remind uh, the public, and I will send out a re another reminder tomorrow, that the Arlington Public Schools is co-sponsoring a forum on Saturday night. I, I, I think that this, this parking is going to be fine. We keep holding our breath to know whether it would have to be canceled be because of that, of more snow, but I think we'll be, we should be fine. It's, um, the title of the forum is Unequal Justice, the Consequences of Our Race and Class in Our Criminal Justice System. And we have a panel discussion from Arlington's acting, well, be our Chief Ryan, who's, who's now remaining our uh, police chief, uh, um, Peniel Joseph, who is a civil rights historian and activist, and Don Perry, a parole reform activist. And this will be Saturday night, um, this coming Saturday, the 28th, from 7 to 9 at Arlington Town Hall. It's free. <laughs> the cookies? For a Saturday night out, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I want to, there's a couple of really um, nice things I want to acknowledge in the music department. Every year there is an all state um, Ma uh, Massachusetts Music Educator Association Conference, and um, they invite Ban they invite bands, orchestras, choral groups across the state to send tapes, uh, and and they choose from these tapes um, different groups that they would invite because of their outstanding mm -hmm. sound and performance. We Arlington Music has been represented at this conference multiple times in the last decade, and in fact. Um, the Arlington High School Honors Orchestra has been invited this year to perform at the conference, which will be on March 20th. So congratulations to Tina D'Agostino, the whole department, because it really this begins in the early grades, and that's and these these students are mentored all the way through up through high school. Additionally, um, a congratulations goes out to um, Tina D'Agostino because um, his proposal for the 2015 uh, National In-Service Conference, a fun approach to jazz improvisation with strings has been accepted as a 60-minute minute session at the National Conference. So he will be going to uh, Nashville, Tennessee next October to pr provide this um, session. So congratulations to Mr. D'Agostino as well. I also wanted to give you athletic update tonight because we our teams this year are doing extraordinarily well. Um, they're all in postseason right now, not all, but but number of them in postseason. And um, so, girls hockey, uh, I, I guess, is won again, and so they're they're moving on to Saturday night playing in Reading. The girls basketball team is going to be playing. They won 70-45 uh, on Monday, and they'll be playing in Woburn at, um, on Saturday night. The boys' basketball team had a bye because their record was so good, but they are going to be playing this at home Friday night against Marblehead. The boys' hockey team also got a bye because of their good record, and they will be playing uh, the winner of the St. Mary Winchester game Sunday at Stoneham Marina. All of these, by the way, are on our athletic website if anybody would like to attend these. The, at the state wrestling tournament, uh, two of our students, Andrew Ellis and Nick Rose, took first place in their weight class, making them state champions. Um, and they will compete in the all-state wrestling competition this weekend. At the division state track meet, the girls' indoor track relay set a new school record for the 4 by 200 um, meter relay and the 4 by 400 meter relay. So it's really been an absolutely outstanding season. Um, last season, we had a team go to the states, and it looks very likely. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. We'll look. They're doing very well, and we're very proud of all of their uh, uh, proud of their achievement. And the last thing I want to bring up is 
because we we won't meet it's not because it's actually next week, is the National School Breakfast Week. Do you notice how there's, a national, there's always some kind of special? <laughs> yeah. But this, we're at the National School Breakfast Week, and, and our Director of Food Service, Denise Boucher, has been planning um, for this for a while. And um, she, she has said that they are planning some very special breakfast entrees next week. Um, and maybe I'll give away the Monday one because it's, one that I maybe want to come in for is warm cinnamon mini rolls. Mm. There's quite, quite, a, quite a selection. She's also going to be doing a survey of our students that take the morning to see what they like and um, use that as uh, information for going forward. She's going to be having um, some more outreach to, to students. She's putting up posters and posters such as, such as this, Why School Breakfast? But one of the things they have found, she has found in other surveys similar to this, is that one of the reasons why some students do not come for the breakfast is that they um, they eat breakfast at home, which is perfectly appropriate. But there, we're, she's particularly reaching out to our students that that qualify for free and reduced lunch, and encouraging uh, them to come in for mm -hmm. the breakfasts that are provided. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Yes. Thank you. There's that. Oh, yes, 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 thank you. I'm going to let Mr. Spiegel speak to this, and that is the approval of a, a particular job description that we have for the data specialist. Yeah. So this is the data specialist job description that you have in the, in the Novus packet. Um, this is a new position that really takes the place of um, the consultant that the district has used for, um, for several years um, in doing our helping us do our state reporting, our mandated mm -hmm. state and federal reporting. The data reporting uh, expectations and requirements of school districts have increased every year. We feel we need to bring this expertise in-house now. Um, we, this um, is part of a larger reorganization. We'll talk about the other part at the next meeting, but um, at this point we'd like to post for this job and be able to seek to hire someone who's, who's qualified in the areas that we need um, the expertise in technology and state and federal data um, databases and and, um, and I don't know if, uh, if Dr. Chesson or Dr. Brody have anything to add. I, I think that's exactly right. One of the things we have found with having a consultant who has been very good, I'm not, we've, she's been a consultant to, for us for seven years in fact, but it's, it's, it's much we've come to realize how important it is to actually have somebody in-house that you can work with and sit down and, and, and talk about some of, the, some of the data rather than have it go by email and phone calls. And, and she has retired as of December uh, this year, and which gave us an opportunity to really rethink what, how we are going to be organizing all of the different data needs that we have. And so we're, as, as Mr. Spiegel said, we are in a reorganization it's just that one other part of it still needs some um, discussion with uh, one of the unions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the data specialist job description so moved second is there a second, a second. <laughs> any further discussion yeah in, in looking at this uh, you know this position I know well because I've uh, dealt with the person who, who does this in, in, in Lowell, uh, and I deal with that person on an extended basis. Um, my question is, why do we state as a flat out requirement a, a bachelor's degree for this position? Because some of the people that we've had in, in our district and also seen working in other districts don't have the bachelor's degree, but have enough of a background in terms of doing this kind of database manipulative stuff to be a very, very strong candidate. Um, mm. That's a consideration. I mean, that is I, a consideration. I, I, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we could make that a um, preferred. Preferred. preferred or other relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also some of the technology. It, it's, it's not so much a hardware kind of thing. There's sort of a zen to this in terms of the organizing and working with this and moving data back and forth mm -hmm. between different applications. Um, it's not really a technology position. It's really something that's a niche. So 
uh, and we have trouble filling these kind of positions. Mm -hmm. So that the more we have on this thing that's recommended vis-a-vis -vis required, uh, I think the easier time you're going to have for finding this because sometimes the person who really just has their head in the zone to do this isn't somebody who has a traditional background and isn't somebody who completed a four-year degree. Mm -hmm. That's good feedback. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. And the funding for this, so the um, the pay is basically the same that we would have paid the consultant, so it's kind well, of a... It's, it also takes into account another, um, something that uh, was in the, is in the proposed budget in terms of the, um, in the reorganization um, lines, the restructuring. There w there's a half-time assistant um, who works um, with data and mm -hmm. registration, and the thought in the reorganization is that position would no longer be needed. And so that part of the funds come from that position. Okay. Mm. Cool. Sorry. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. We all set? Mm -hmm. Moving on to the consent agenda. All items listed are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 15109 dated February 12, 2015. Total warrant amount $496,002.54. Approval of minutes, school committee regular meeting, minutes, excuse me, February 12, 2015. So moved. Second. Set. Any discussion? Uh, excuse me, there's no discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Subcommittee liaison reports. Uh, is there any from uh, policies and procedures that would like to share anything? Okay. Budget, Ms. Starks. Uh, budget subcommittee will meet from 5 to 6.30 on Wednesday, March 4th. Our agenda so far includes the budget. Um, update and information uh, from the BRTF, which was held on Monday. I'll talk about that in a minute. And um, preparing for the FinCom review of our budget, which is coming up and preparing the town book for town meeting. Um, also on Monday, um, uh, several of us were there for the uh, Budget Revenue Task Force meeting on Monday. That's the meeting of uh, FinCom and um, the selectmen and school committee and a whole bunch of other people um, talking about the budget. And there were no surprises having attended all of the long-term planning and uh, prep meetings. Um, Adam's uh, proposed budget is uh, what we saw the last time, so um, we do in fact see that uh, reduction mm -hmm. in our funds over the next couple of years down to 3% in general education funding. Um, but um, so the news is of course now that the long-term budget plan now has the shortfall in fiscal year 2021, it's a $10 million shortfall. Um, and I thought that the most interesting thing actually that came out of the evening was that Selectman uh, Dan Dunn proposed an idea which was um, that given that the cliff is $10 million in 2021, he suggested that perhaps what we should do is do a smaller override somewhere in the range of 2 to $3 million around fiscal year 2018. Um, and his idea behind that was that that way we can all kind of put right on the table if it passes we will continue with the services you have and we will you know start to bank this money so that we can kind of basically push out needing another override mm -hmm. and if we don't here's the list of things we're going to cut and it's a smaller amount of cuts it's not a 10 million cut, which is really painful and kind of, and it's like losing a limb, mm -hmm. versus a two or three million dollar cut, which is easier to come back from if we have to kind of, you know, do that if it doesn't pass. So I like that idea. I want to, I want to support um, Dan in that thinking and planning. I, I think that mm -hmm. that's just a better way to go about it than having a really big override. I think that maybe a smaller override and then people can kind of decide, you know, do I want these services? If I don't want these services, then that's the way they can vote and that's what's gonna happen. And I just thought it was an interesting way to put it instead of, 
you know, kind of waiting until the mm -hmm. really big cliff. So I don't know. It's something he's willing to bring up, and I know that the selectmen will be discussing. So mm -hmm. there were two other things that uh, were brought up. Uh, there was a statement made that the the budget is being level funded, and Ms. Stocks brought to everyone's attention with some of the things that have already been cut this year, the kindergarten grant and mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. METCO were basically not being level funded. Right. Uh, the other part was the presentation took into account that the, uh, uh, it, it, di the, it didn't take into account but mentioned that uh, <coughs> the Minuteman School renovation and our high school coming up renovation are not part of these plans too. So. Uh, I agree with Ms. Starks. I think Mr. Dunn's uh, suggestion is a positive, is a good way to look at this and deal with it uh, ahead of time. But we still have those other two aspects on top of that mm -hmm. going forward. Okay. That's uh, it. Uh, community relations, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, due to all that snow, uh, <laughs> um, things get bumped and bumped and bumped. So the community relations subcommittee meeting we had for this week, uh, it will actually occur next Thursday at 6.30 in this very wonderful room. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. We meet March 19th. Okay. Um, the superintendent's evaluation group will be meeting on March 3rd at 5 p.m. with a hope to report back to the full committee on March 12th uh, on two areas. Okay. And let me just... Bounce back. Was there another one? Let's see. Okay. Are there any announcements from the board? Any members like to share? Okay. Uh, from the chair, uh, Metco on the Hill, uh, the, uh, please let Karen, uh, for March 19th, they're gathering to uh, ask members, school committee members, if you can uh, go that day uh, to speak to the le uh, different legislators in support of uh, preventing the cuts, and uh, just what Dr. Brody was talking about. Uh, I would ask any member that thinks they may want to attend, please contact Karen. She'll set it up and make the appointments. Uh, it's similar to uh, going on the Hill. It's a similar type thing to go up and speak to the different people. I will be going. Uh, I don't, hopefully that doesn't dissuade any of you from coming as well. Uh, I'm looking for uh, two other members to review and negotiate uh, contracts. We have two of our top administrative contracts they're expiring on June 30th we have we are required by the contracts to notify them by April 1st if we're going to uh, go for it so I, I probably one or two meetings uh, those that are interested you can either contact me to I will send you copies of the current contracts um, and uh, we can set up a meeting if you want to volunteer now it's up to you or we can talk we can discuss that um, please I'd ask all members to look at policy BDAA regarding uh, applying for positions on the board, the chair, vice chair, and uh, uh, look at the policy, contact Karen, and uh, going forward, uh, I've never understood why members of the, uh, the former chairs were so excited to vacate the chair, but mm -hmm. uh, I've enjoyed it. No, one, but, no one's uh, excited to leave. It takes a lot of time, things like that. Anything else? Okay. Um, at this time, uh, we're gonna enter executive session to conduct strategies uh, in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if in an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares. We will uh, come back to uh, public session only for the purpose of adjournment. Uh, uh, roll call to go. Uh, yes. 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 I'm sorry. A motion to go to a, a German. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. Roll call. Yes. 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 yes.